Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jean-Daniel Roussel, the president of Java Card Forum, and uh, I have the pleasure to welcome you for the first of the series of uh, Java Card Forum webinar, and I thank you for attending. While we give the other a couple of minutes to connect, I will just uh, give a couple of words on the Java Card Forum. The Java Card Forum is an industry association promoting Java Card and driving the evolution of Java Card technology. Uh, as you probably know, Java Card is a platform of choice for a secure application that has been deployed on billions of uh, devices, and it addresses a wide range of segments. And uh, especially, the latest Java Card specification 3.1 is shot by Oracle a little less than two years ago, and uh, some feature adapted to the Internet of Things. In the Internet of Things, uh, we all know that TLS protocol is a key component for the IoT security. In the first talk of this seminar will show how TLS implementations can benefit from Java Card, either in embedded SIM or other secure elements. The talk is given by Daniel Hübner, uh, who is system architect for the Infineon Optica Trust Security Chip Portfolio at Infineon. Daniel has over 15 years experience in smart card industry and in several domains such as the eSIM and the payment and the government. If you have any questions, uh, please ask the question in the user interface in the question field and we'll collect them and we will try to answer most of them uh, at the end of the meeting. And also note that the slides, we will email you the slides uh, tomorrow so you can really focus on the presentation and you will have the presentation sent to you by email. Daniel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sean Daniel. As always, welcome from my side. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Yes. Right, perfect. Yes, so also welcome from my side. Um, in this webinar, I want to talk about the GSMA IoT Safe applet specification coming from the GSMA, which is a wonderful idea bringing um, trusted CQ cloud communication to the ESM. And we here at Infineon made up our mind if this specification would not also fit for non in products like regular CQ elements, which we also see very often in the market. So I clustered the presentation in five different segments. I start with a very high level description of the use case, CQ cloud authentication. So establishing a CQ con connection between an IoT device and the cloud service providers, namely AWS, Azure, and Co., using DDL TLS protocol. Then I would like to give a really high level overview about what the cheese and IoT safe specification is about, which provides a common API provided by a Java card applet using, uh, used as a root of trust by IoT devices. Then the central point of this presentation is really uh, the question if this uh, specification could also be used for non-cellular secure elements, so uh, cellular uh, secure elements, which not relates to um, mobile phones or SIMs also, but maybe to other interfaces like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, Zigbee, things like this. Then um, I would like to give you a little perspective from Infineon point of view, why this IoT safe applet is so beneficial for us. And in between, I give also a high-level use case demonstration, demonstration about our connected multicopter, which is used for uh, geofencing purposes using LTE connectivity. Okay, then directly into the topic. Use case here is, I'm explaining here is transport layer security. So you have on the left hand side an IoT device, typically, for example, a smart meter. And on the right hand side, some um, web uh, cloud based uh, service, typically uh, operated by a utility company, for example, when we talk about smart meters, and they are collecting data over an over, over data, acquisi data acquisition service running here on this uh, cloud service. 
in between the communication is secured over a secure channel, namely the transport and secure, uh, clear security channel protocol. Um, this is necessary because uh, as those smart meter uh, data is quite sensitive, it's end user, end user, con uh, end user data which have some privacy properties inside. So a good level of security and notification is absolutely necessary here. So having now a look into the, the system, uh, typically such an IoT device consists out of a host MCU running an operating system with the application required, typically a messaging protocol implementation like MQTT for TLS or co-op for uh, uh, UDP. Then also very essential is the network stack, which provides the basic TCP IP connection between those two entities. And then the central point here in this, uh, for this use case, is really the TLS library. There are quite a couple of stacks available. Very well known is the um, OpenSSL library in Linux or Embed TLS coming from ARM. And that's providing basically the security layer on top of TCP IP, the trusted layer, uh, the trust transport layer security. Um, we all know the TLS protocol from the web browsers whenever we um, type in HTTPS in our browser, that S is basically indicating that we open up here a transport layer security channel, the TLS channel between the, the web server and the browser. In this case, the, here in this case, really is when the case from the, from the web browser and the, the, the web server, it's really the, um, uh, the, the web server authenticating to the client and sending over a certificate from which, um, um, from which the uh, signature is verified. That's, and then in, in a further step, basically the shared secret is derived, which is then used to encrypt the, uh, the further uh, communication between those two parties. As said, so here in, in, the, other, in the case of the, of the web server, it's only the web server who's authenticating itself to the client. This is a little bit different in the uh, IoT. Is it also absolutely necessary that um, the client, in this case the IoT device, the smart meter, authenticates to the uh, cloud servers? Otherwise, an um, adversary have an easy game to uh, spoof the communication, modify, alter the communication, and uh, change the authenticity of, of data sent. And this could have an impact on, on billing and so on. So, this is absolutely critical that also the IoT devices are authenticating to be genuine. Um, for this authentication, typically, right, typically uh, secure credentials are required, namely a private key, which is, uh, which is used to sign challenges coming in, um, device certificates, sending basically a public key in order to establish this channel. And in this scenario here, as you see it here, uh, all the sensitive device, uh, all the sensitive credentials are somewhat laying around in the, in the stack of the TS library which are of course then somewhat um, susceptible to um, exploits from the OS or from the application, right? Um, it's not a very secure way of, of doing this. A much better way of doing this uh, is here depicted in this block diagram. Uh, those will be the same, but you would exclude, uh, you would basically um, uh, uh, Put all those trust credentials, so the device private key certificates, and so on, in a dedicated external secure element, which is then not residing anymore um, with the application and the operating system. That's a very important step because um, such a secure element provides a much uh, smaller attack surface than basically here this, this big application processor with all the applications with a multi threading operating system, many pins, many interfaces. And here, this one is really had then also security in mind. Uh, the operating systems are written in, in a secure manner. Also, there is some certain protection coming from the hardware, the operating system for local and also remote attacks, and also the interfaces. The interface complexity is quite low. Typically, an I2C is, is provided to the host MCU. Then on the host MCU is also an I2C driver and an a protocol implementation required. And then uh, in such a scenario, the host library is basically outsourcing or um, basically bringing all the functionality outside which is required for the TLS handshake. So in a formal concept, basically this, this was handled by the TLS library directly. But in this scenario now, 
um, is the, the external CK element that's responsible for doing the handshake because for the handshake uh, all those credentials here below are required. So also, also this has to be part of the CK element. And then of course the CK element have to provide a proper interface for to the host library um, that they basically can drive this um, handshake inside the CK element. So there is, for example, an, an interface required for um, signing a challenge, verifying um, a, a, sign a, a signature from a certificate, generating them with the other functions, basically, that uh, share a secret between those two entities, which is then exported to the host library, which is then used for the bulk encryption of the transport layer security. And so we see here this inter interface here just becomes crucial. And this is now really where also the uh, IoT safe specification comes into the game. So IoT safe stands for IoT SIM applet for secure end-to-end -end communication. You already see here it's really was designed with having an ESIM in mind. But it's actually so as I said, basically it's exactly what they're defining. They're defining now this um, this the specifications required for by the TLS uh, implement TLS stack to access the security, the secure credentials and um, the TLS handshake protocol inside NCP element. And we see here, uh, it's, it's in, this is a picture coming directly from the GSNA. So you have the UACC operating system and then there's such things like a security domain. And typically this IoT safe um, applet is then residing inside of an um, MNO profile or with newer concepts could be also outside of the MNO profile in a dedicated security domain meant for such generic purposes. But as most, even, even all of the embedded USCs currently out there are um, based on a Java code operating system and also here this concept of security domains and so on is not uh, really um, foreign to, to all the generic Java card products. There is no real reason why this IoT safe applet I could not also be operated on a generic Java core CPU element, for example. And when we do so, we would basically reach a really standardized approach um, for both forms of secure element, the ESIM, and also uh, non cellularized secure elements. And this would also ease the integration efforts with the middleware ecosystem, for example, OpenSSL, because in this um, this libraries, this already the maintainer of the of this of the stacks basically, they only have to consider one interface and not many from the various in the various interface implementations. So this is would be really a great achievement here. If we get basically this common interface done, and this is this is why we really think that's a great idea to have such an such an such an specification available. The IoT safe specification already reached version 1.0 at the GSMA, and it's available free to download from the GSMA website. Besides this, there's also a nice um, implementation guide here depicted in, in pink. So that's explaining a bit the use cases, uh, what could be achieved with, uh, with that uh, security, with this interface specification, and also some guidance for personalization purposes. It's very good to read, so um, it's also very easy to understand. It's a very good document reading it. Yes, and now coming back to the architecture diagram from before, with now having the IoT safe in form of an applet, yeah, our generic CQ element from bef before is now turning into a Java card CQ element with the Java card operating system and the interfaces provided by an IoT safe applet, which is great because we can then, then Java card here really is the basis for even further standardization. And I'm thinking here of this uh, I2C uh, layer, we also saw in the other picture. This is also typically today quite a proprietary solutions out there. And we even can drive this to further standardization with, for example, using the I2C protocol implementation coming from global platform uh, where they have specified I2C SPI communication over uh, APD, um, using APUs. So they're using, they have basically using the same, almost the same APU T, uh, T1 protocol. They modified it a bit, therefore they call it the T1 prime protocol. 
but is providing basically APU communication over I2C. And this now makes it the TLS library uh, providers really easy to support such external security elements. Because we understand it's um, sometimes not so easy, it's a bit effort to integrate into the CPU element. Of course, you gain a lot of security with that with that approach, but there is the, the integration of what is is somewhat existing. And in such an approach, it could be really brought to an absolute acceptable level. You can even you can almost say it's a kind of a plug and play security. Uh, what do we mean by this plug and play security? You, you know this from from a regular sim when you plug this already in secure element, when you plug this into the telephone and the operating systems basically providing the support out of the box. You plug this in and it's, and it's functional. And um, such a vision we have also for embedded secure elements that uh, it's very easy to integrate this and that uh, the time to market is low and cost and all the effort is it's really low. So for us having here a high level of standardization on all across the entire platform is something uh, we drive really, really well, really, really a lot. Okay, so the, the question might come up, um, why OEMs are spending the effort, the time and over the money, of course, such a securement costs money to integrate such a securement into their devices. Uh, here from our experience, as we are selling those kind of products for a while now, I can, you, I can name you five reasons. The first one is secure trust provision decoupled from the main MCU firmware. As we know, such an, uh, many of those devices, IoT devices, are somewhat manufactured by an electronic manufacturing service. And here is the wish to be from the OEMs. As an, and this, yeah, this electronic manufacturing service also taking care for uh, provisioning the host MCU with the operating systems and also the, the the applications and the data required for this. But um, what typically OEMs doesn't want to do is really share also this sensitive credentials with them. So all this keys required for connecting with their cloud servers, with their cloud systems, also manufacturing data and so on. And they really would, would like to keep this um, Provisioning of this trust credential separated from the uh, from the firmware from the firmware loading to the MCU, and here such a secure element provides a good container of doing this in that way. So um, uh, typically, um, an OEM is coming to us and wanted giving us their trust credentials, and uh, we should personalize them on our CC certified common carrier certified sites, which provides already a good um, level of trust to them. And so it's very important to them to really keep this separated. Otherwise, um, um, such things could get out of control, right? Um, you never know what's happening with these devices in the EMS. And um, this is a very important reason why customers from us go in here for an, an, an external secure element. The other one is, um, must be said, it's physical temper resistance. Um, typically, this complete, the, uh, micro, the MCU is already microprocessors in such devices getting even more complex. And also, security is sometimes. A topic there, um, we learned this here uh, from Spectrum Meltdown, Rohammer Clock Screw. This is um, this is this is quite a topic, and um, as such, small secure elements provide that basically providing a much smaller attack surface. Um, the idea is that uh, those little devices not are so 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 susceptible to this kind of attacks. The um, as said, basically those devices are really designed with um, attack resistance in mind. Uh, the, the, the chip the chip providing uh, this, um, the, 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 the means here to protect against uh, especially physical attacks as they are coming to be from the payment and government world. Also the operating systems are absolutely designed with kind of security in mind. And also the, 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 the operating system is typically a single threat operating system. So keeping complexity low and making it verifiable with pen testing and so on. And also the um, the interfaces uh, are not so many, so that the text surface in, in general is very small. Certification and regulation is also a topic. Uh, we see this in some markets and with some customers that uh, already by today, a certified, a certified secure element is required. E.g. in China, the Ali Cloud is requiring secured, uh, certified secure elements, or at least that a third party had a 
look into it and uh, checking for the security. And then another topic is they want to prepare for, for long-term requirements. Uh, we see a trend here, which, for example, in Europe with the Cybersecurity Act that um, it might be it might become necessary to have certified products somewhere in the in the market and here customer our ones preparing already by today. And then also it's about proving state-of-the-art security by using a certified product. That means um, that here in OEM having a good argument in hand in case in a rare case in a seldom case that something is happening, a security incident is is is, is happening, that they have an, also for liability reasons a good uh, argument in the hand. Look, I was using the uh, certified product here. I really did the best I can, and proving with this really that their device is state of the art security. Another important reason is what we see is the uh, persistent storage for flashless SOC. What does this mean is that um, in those IoT devices, more and more application processes are used with extremely small technology nodes, typically smaller 10 nanometer. So you know the first product going down to five nanometers and in that small technology nodes, you cannot efficiently accommodate and, and flash anymore. So all the flash have to go outside of the chip and um, this is then typically a, a big raw flash uh, connected via white uh, data posted to, to the application processor. It's also not the best case for storing sensitive materials. And also especially, especially the counters, pins and things like this. Um, the, the, the OEMs are looking for other solutions and uh, such an external secure element becomes quite handy for this. So they are using then secure elements to store pop pins, all the secure credentials and things like this, counters, um, just because this is what we see more and more. And last but not least, also a very um, and, and, uh, important topic is that we, uh, that means semiconductor manufacturer can provide during the wafer test, a very fast and cost-efficient uh, personalization of the device. As you might know, and during the wafer process, basically uh, we, we do um, the semiconductor manufacturer is testing 100% of all chips. So during the production, basically every chip is contacted and, and, and the test is, ex is operated on that chip. And the semiconductor manufacturer is using this test also to um, play some uh, data OS applications on the chip and as this is happening in a massive parallel manner this is really the most cost efficient and uh, fast uh, process you can get if it's if it comes to really high volumes so these are the five reasons why customers are choosing a discrete secure element for their applications and now coming to something uh, different and this is about um and a real world use case. We're working together with our partner Prime Key, um, who, who brought, uh, brought this use case to us. Um, so first of all, I need to mention that uh, this is now about drones, and we at Infineon, we have a, a good team here in place who are designing and assembling these multicopters for us, uh, for very small ones, um, small as a, as, a, as a palm of a hand to really big ones which are able to pull an, a kite server or in, in, in wakeboarder over a lake or in, or in creek. And this is quite interesting. So this is really, really this is really a cool um, drone. It's quite big, 150 kilos, kilogram um, in weight. There are videos available on our landing page at Infineon. I will provide you the links. You can check them out. It's really, really nice. And um, so we use this kind of Yet in Finning used this um, this drones or multicopters, as you will, um, to demonstrate uh, our components, our various Infineon components, mainly for and from the from the power range. So power MOSFETs for the motor control are shown in this, but also security becomes more and more relevant. And here is really one problem we are showcasing here with the drones from the um, let's say from 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 my business line is. Um, preventing multi-copter flights over absolute no-fly zones like airports. As we all know, two years ago at London Heathrow, they had to shut down the airport because a couple of um, drones basically were flying over the airport and that uh, causing a really, really big trouble. And since then, since then, latest since then, uh, our drone was, has been perceived as a major threat to re regular flight operations, especially over 
um, for web ports. And we developed here a little um, demonstrator, which also acts, um, um, acts as a proof of concept because we're working here with different stakeholders together. We're working here in a European uh, project and bring this to life. Unfortunately, there is no real video available from this demo, but I have some slides which uh, show you the, the use case. So let's go into the topic. Let's explain this in, in some detail. Okay, so here what you see. Um, we, first of all, we developed this concept together with our partner Primekey, who brought this uh, use case to us. Primekey is a um, um, a PKI infrastructure provider, really a major one, having huge, huge customers, and they are driving such solutions. Um, the problem here, what we have is that those uh, multi-copters are typically very small, so they cannot be detected by regular radar systems uh, from the airport. So we need to provide uh, some other technology instead. And organizations like the GSMA or the European uh, Aerospace Administration and some of the MNOs are thinking about uh, using a uh, cellular con connection for, to solving this problem. The theory is really that in the future, uh, each and every drone will be equipped uh, with an LTU or 5G modem. Those modems come significantly cheap, so that really uh, every um, drone in the future, with, starting with a certain price point, maybe $50 or so, will be equipped with such a modem. The, the, the most, uh, foremost use case why those drones are equipped with the LTE is normally that um, they provide, it's, this is used to control the, the drone um, from remote uh, in, in, an, in an out of sight operation. For a delivery drone, for example, uh, this, there's no pilot anymore sit, uh, standing on the ground and, and looking up to the drone and shows where it's flying. This is really contro remote, remotely controlled over in a uh, drone operations and also. But is also this LTE connection is also used uh, as a back channel to transfer video data from an um, inspection of critical infrastructures or maintenance things. So this connection is used and also to transfer data back to the operators. And then this connection, the idea is, uh, becomes also very handy um, to control the location of the drone and match it um, with the coordinates from an absolute no-fly zone, right? So this is known, so this, those GPS coordinates where this, where this absolute no-fly zones are known, they are basically public. And um, so you can, the idea is that this is basically matched, the location, the actual location of the drone is matched with this location from this no-fly zone, and then the measurements are taken. So uh, first of all, the drone is, um, the way that works is, so the, typically an air traffic control manager, so the, um, the air traffic um, coordinator, they are running basically also in the cloud service in, in the air. And this drone is connected. So basically it's performing in the first step also this TLS authentication. Here already a binding to the owner of the drone is happening. So we also have here an identification in this sense. So um, by doing this, by the by before starting the drone, this, this the drone will automatically connect itself to a, to a cloud service doing authentication. Where also some of the pilot data gets is involved and transferred to the um, to the cloud service, which already is is a good level of security because then uh, we can expect some more um, responsible behavior from the pilot already by this. But then the next step is and here we're going a step further. Uh, so the IoT Safe applet on that ESIM and, and the drone is then not only used for the authentication step anymore, but it's also used to assign sensor data. And the sensor data in this case is the all the GPS coordinates taken from a GPS sensor inside the drone. But also here, it's that's um, securing those sensor data is quite important because uh, changing them and changing those data over and in between of the drone to the to the cloud, of course, this would also have some some would a little bit um, put the entire concept down. So the idea is the GPS sensor is first sending its data to the uh, IoT, uh, IoT Safe applet, where it gets signed with a with uh, key provided by an official authority. And then this um, signed sensor data is sent over to the cloud service, where it's constant, and this, it's, this is happening in a very frequent manner. And from there, basically, the air traffic operator is reading this out. 
And if some match with a no-fly zone is detected, some countermeasures are taken, taken typically by the, typically a, a jamming of the drone or basically the pilot is contacted, things like this. And then we on the other side, and this is also interesting, there are other uh, special permits, uh, special no-fly zones. We see it here, for example, this wind park. Of course, also drone flights are absolutely not wanted on those uh, on those parks. But there are sometimes maybe um, the request to maintain or inspect here the rotors um, on that on that on the towers here, for example. And so they can then shut down this, the, opera, the, the, the operation of that, of that wind towers here. And then basically a drone flight is theoretically possible. But now we have the situation that um, it's 99% it's of the time this is a, is a, is a, is a no-fly zone. And here basically this, um, the drone have to be provisioned with a new kind of certificate, which is provides, which, which, are, which have an, only a certain validity, validity uh, period. Maybe in two hours or so, this certificate gets then issued to the drone over the air, and then a drone flight is allowed for a certain time with the validity period of the certificates issued for that for the purpose. Yes, and this is a quite interesting use case. As a real world use case, our our partner here, Chronicle, has been approached with this concept, and um, as said, permission is here granted via personalization of certificates. And I'm sorry. The provision is also managed by a PKI system, currently providing here the technology, they enabling, for example, those airports or the service providers, right? This is also how this how this works. So there are typically specialized service providers uh, doing this, this, doing this uh, maintenance and inspection of, uh, flights for you. And they don't have normally no clue how to set up a prime key, how to issue, how to create certificates, how to issue certificates, and so on. And here uh, prime key provides the technology. Yes. Then, um, so this was now a more um, LTE ESM based IoT safe use case. Now I want to show you something out of the uh, non cellular world, but also related to drones. And for this, I have a little video explaining this very nicely. I start this here. Now, I hope you can see it. So, these are our drones. Um, we typically built in uh, here in Pinion. Uh, this is our Larix drone. This is made for um, educational purposes. So um, typically, we send this to um, we send this to to universities who are developing then basically their projects on top of this. And I'll stop in here because it's quite interesting. You see here this is our Larix drone. This is then here the, uh, the the motor control board, the blue one, and then there's a Raspberry a small Raspberry Pi on top of this, which acts here as a flight controller for the drone. And now we, are, in my business line, what we are doing, basically, we are created here this little adult board for the Raspberry Pi. And you might, oops, sorry, let me start again. Um, yeah, you see this here that um, is, um, maybe it's coming a bit later. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is already equipped with, an, um, with, with one of our Optiga uh, elements for the non cellular use case. But it's already prepared for eSIMs and also for classical SIMs. You see this here. So this is this is the uh, our uh, non-cellular secure product. This is our this is the footprint for an eSIM, and this is a slot for a regular SIM. So we can also we can also bring basically the use case we have shown before uh, onto this drone here, as you see here. Uh, but this, as said, basically the use case here behind is uh, more on the non-cellular world. Because what what you see in a very short time, that the pilot initiates a TLS connection between the remote control and the drone. Uh, we see this here. So um, the remote control the drone is a mobile phone, and you see here there is also an, a SIM card in the in the mobile phone, running a kind of an early version of the IoT Safe applet, and then basically a TLS connection is initiated from the telephone to the drone. But here, and the communication from that phone to the um, to the to the drone is happening over Wi-Fi. So it's not LTE; it's it's Wi-Fi, and that shows already the need for such 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 um, non-cellular secure elements because not all of this wireless connectivity is, of course, not uh, all, everything LTE or 5G 
is also Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, CP, et cetera, like, like we show in this case here. And here by this now the pilot pen operated on round. This is by the way here our Infinium Campion, where also normally is also normally a fly no fly zone, and uh, we need also the permission here to make this video. Uh, but quite nice. And you see here we use we use this also as a platform to accommodate our security use cases, geofencing, battery authentication, and things like that. It's I would say quite a nice um, demonstrator. Okay, uh, I think that was enough. So if you are interested in more details of this uh, of this of this concept of the secure and commercial clones of use cases, he wrote in a quite extensive white paper, which is available from with this link, explaining uh, the concept in more detail, the work we have with uh, with decentralization organizations. The project we're working in uh, it's very nice very nice to read and if you're interested in channel about our drone uh, program i would recommend you going to our infinium multicopter and drones website from there you get all of the instructions how to build your own drone using components from us uh, you also see the, all the videos besides this one there are 10 others very cool ones with like i mentioned this before the big drone pulling and um Putting or putting putting this wake border over over the lake. That's very nice. This was this happening in cooperation with, with Red Bull. Okay, now I would like to give you a little bit the perspective from Infineon why the cheese IoT safe app that is so relevant for us. So we have this one IoT safe, a tower cut app that now, and we can use it not only two but four products so first of all we also have an uh, um, cellular lineup and an ESIM portfolio with uh, our optical connect IoT which is an M2M which is an ESIM following the M2M specification and our optical connect consumer following the RSP specification both of them of course operated operating um, having a Java card inside and this GSM IoT safe app that can go there and can be used as intended by the chief mail. On the other side, we have also our non-cellular secure element portfolio, uh, namely here our Secure Connect as so a payment secure element for wearables. But you never know, there might become also in the wearables market a requirement that some service wants to connect to a cloud. And then also the IoT safe app that would be a good fit on this product. And then of course, very important uh, for our IoT lineup, um, we have also Tower Core products here, like OpenTR Trust P, and also this applet can be used there. So one applet, um, basically for four products. So that means for us now, uh, only one time the applet development, only one time verification and documentation. And this is not only for the IoT safe applet itself, but this is also for the middleware, which we also need to provide on the um, on the on the host system, right? So. And so, that, so it's really important for us that we provide our customers with a really easy to integrate solution and also be delivering here the middleware with that. And what we hear so from the GSMA that they also take currently um, have a work going on to also specify APIs for that middleware. And also we get here then all the support from them. But um, of course, that's already a good relief for our R&D, but uh, it would even, um, a more a further release if you would um, source this jar, this this IoT safe applet, and that's also possible as it's uh, as it's made for the Java card and following this uh, open standard here from the from the cheese and A. Um, basically, everybody can develop such an applet, and we can source it and also from from outside of Infinium, which is also great for us. We'll be doing more of this in the future. Yes, by having said this, I come to an end of my presentation. Here are a little bit the key takeaways um, that for key, for IoT cloud authentication, um, discrete hardware root of trust are frequently asked by OEMs. So this is not a rare case. This, this is an ongoing market. Many, many, we shipping many, many uh, pieces of this. Um, the great idea of IoT safe can also be extended to non cellular products. I think this is possible. There are some, there is some work to do and we, we are driving this in the GSMA. For example, that the trust provisioning is, is more designed for, for an ESIM. And here we, we think that we not we need to have some further interfaces to also get this done uh, for, for um, 
products beyond telehealing. And also very much very important key takeaways, we have plug and play security requires standardization on different levels. And this is also something we try to achieve here with this IoT Safe applet, because we can combine it with other standards as well, like shown for from GP ISQC or the APT over ISQC uh, implementation, uh, which at the end will make it very easy for our customers to integrate shot CPR on it. Yes, and now um, I come to an end. I would like to thank you for all your attention and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. So on behalf of the Java Card Forum, um, we really appreciate you presenting that today, especially as you've done it twice in one day. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you. We have um, a couple of questions that have come in from the attendees. Um, if there are any more questions, feel free to just type them in now into the uh, questions bar and I will ask them to Daniel. So the first question we have is from Werner Ness. And his question is, um, he says, the trust anchor, is it different to private keys? Oh, I think we seem to have lost Daniel at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. I'm sorry. Oh, this. oh, that's a relief. <laughs> He's back. Right. Did you hear the question, Daniel? <laughs> yes, I hear the question from Banner. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it is the is this is the private key different from the trust anchor? I, I mean, we use the, the the trust anchor to uh, store the secure key, uh, secure required in the TLS handshake, and um, we make this is a very important asset right from the in, inside the trust anchor, and we. Our, our goal and our strategy is that this uh, secure key never leaves the, um, the trust anchor to the trust device. So it's an essential part of, of, the, of the trust anchor. So basically trust anchor is, is a secure element hosting then the, um, the IoT safe applet, uh, including all the credentials, the certificates, the keys required to perform the uh, handshake in the TLS authentication. And so this, uh, they need this, the, the, the private key in this process needs to be provisioned already in the in the, in this in the secure element and we consider them as an important essential part of the of the trust anchor yes okay thank you now we have um, a question from Nabil Norman and I think this refers to slide number four um, and the question is why do we have the device private key at the AWS IOT server side let me go quickly back to it Yeah, so this is this is because uh, they perform a mutual authentication, right? So um, basically, the the cloud servers are authenticating to the security device and the vice versa, and so they perform exactly the same steps here in the TLS protocol they, for the handshake. Basically, sending over, they exchanging the certificates, they challenging each other, and for this challenge, basically, this, this private key is required on both sides. That's the reason why. Um, it's required for, for mutual authentication. For proper mutual authentication, uh, that each devices are basically authenticated to each other. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, another question here. Um, how good is the performance of performing the TLS handshake in the applet? Are there some limits caused by the performance? Um, so we, um, so, um, as I said, we are doing this for quite a while here, right? And we're using this um, so such trust anchors here for quite different applications. We, easy, we, even, we even have customers using this here on the server side, uh, where basically a lot of um, requests coming in from from from, from clients to authentic for for from doing an authentication. And um, so our customers are typically satisfied with the performance of this of this uh, of this handshake. And of course, here, uh, what's inside this hardware, basically, there are crypto accelerators, and uh, for, especially for the for the asymmetric op um, crypto operations. And very often, those small devices are not having the not having not the compute power to perform this um, very fast. And so, even they um, 
uh, the 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 user and, and secure element here to offload the, the main CPU from from doing this. So this is even a performance improvement for some of the controller applications or controllers out used out there for the RT applications. So typically, as I said, our customers are quite happy with the performance. Of course, there's always some improvement possible, and we're working on this. But for the time being, um, we had no big complaints about performance. We were we all were satisfied our customers with the performance provided for our products. Thank you, and um, we have one more here. Um, is there a reference implementation of the middleware? Um, yes, so I see uh, quite a lot of companies out there. Um, and this is, this is really the nice thing now with um, standardized IoT sales specification. I see uh, two or three companies out there working on uh, middleware implementations. And um, I saw that I, I also can provide uh, links to GitHub repositories where they, where they reside. And the answer, answer is definitely yes, there are already some reference implementations available for the middleware. Which may, which might be also used then as a basis for the um, standardization of the middleware API that it is made. But I saw already some middleware reference implementation. Yes, it's available. Okay, so I have um, one final um, comment here from Nabil, who's saying. Um, TLS handshaking should be performed without exposing the private keys for both entities. I think the private key at AWS is for server and not for device. Then the key agreement done using server private key with device public key at server side. But at the device side, key agreement using device private key and server public key. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So um, this was a little bit too too fast for me. Sorry, I was. Yes, I thought there was rather yeah. rather too many keys going on there. So um, um, <laughs> I'll just I'll just read it well, one last it's, time. It's, 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 I, but I would say it's not related to to AWS. It's more related um, into the general transport layer security, and they typically require. Um, it's, it's not. It's not. So also you can you can establish a, a transport layer security also with um, with the device private key only on one side, and it's possible that's then basically an internal authentication, but it's quite handy and it's common to use this on, on both sides as well. So okay. I would say from in the TLS protocol, um, typically um, device private keys is then is an, is an always involved. Yes. Hopefully that answers that, Nabil. And then um, we have a final question here. Um, would the applet be preloaded? How do you see the, the deployment? Yes, so um, we plan to preload those um, those applets with our product. So we provide this as, an, as a turnkey product uh, with a preloaded, preloaded, as a preloaded product um, meant for the purpose of cloud authentication. This is really the plan, and then you offer this also with um, various uh, personalization options. But the idea is to provide this as, an, as a turnkey product with the application preloaded. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. So that looks like we've exhausted the questions. So thank you, everybody, for asking those questions. Um, and obviously, thank you very much for attending and listening to the webinar. And thank you again to Daniel for giving the webinar. Um, as um, Jean-Daniel mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending out a link to the PDF for you to download. Um, if you're interested in any of the other webinars that we're holding and you haven't signed up to them already, um, there'll also be a link in that email where you can go in and, and sign up to some of the other webinars. Um, so on behalf of the Java Card Forum, I'd like to Thank you and have a good morning or evening wherever you are geographically and we hope to, uh, well, virtually see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.